Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk about how we cannot generalize the perceptron to multiple layers, and then we'll define as well um, the backpropagation algorithm. We'll see how it works, and then I will explain at a high level what are some of the important optimizers that you can find, for instance, in packages like TensorFlow as well as PyTorch. So things like Adagrad, RMS Prop, and uh, also Adam. Okay, so. Um, in order to give a little bit of background and to justify the use of multiple layers for neural networks, let's just do a quick recap of what we've discussed so far in terms of linear models and, and also nonlinear models. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write on the board what are the equations that define uh, each of the models that we've seen so far. Okay, so first we talked about linear regression. So for linear regression, we uh, used the following model. So it was W transpose X bar, and it was pretty simple, right? Now if we consider linear classification, We saw three models. The first one was mixture of Gaussians. And then we define mixtures of Gaussians with a prior with respect to each class, um, where this is a, a multinomial. We also use a likelihood function for each class. That's a Gaussian. And then we computed a posterior for each class, which is essentially a constant k times the probability of the class times our likelihood like this. OK, the problem with um, mixtures of Gaussians is that we have a, a strong assumption here that the class conditionals are Gaussians. Then we relax this and we considered logistic regression. So for logistic regression, uh, we first considered the binary case. For the binary case, we had the probability of C given x. That was the sigma id of W transpose x bar. And then for the multi-class case, so probability of CK given X. Is E to the W. K transpose X bar. Divided by the sum over J. E to the W J transpose X bar. OK, so if you recall. This is the sigmoid, and this is the softmax. Now, in both cases, it's still going to give us a, a linear separator. And then after that, we talked about the perceptron. 
And then if we use the threshold activation function, then we have y, which is equal to the sine of w transpose x bar. And if we use the sigma activation function, then we can compute instead the property of y, which is the sigma of w transpose x bar. OK, and here when I write the sine of w transpose x bar, uh, this is just some notation to indicate that whenever this is positive, we're going to label it with one class, let's say the positive class. And then whenever this is negative, we're going to label this with the other class, let's say the negative class. So I know in the slides I use 0 or 1, or sometimes minus 1 or plus 1. So you can think of this as like uh, one way of labeling the classes as, as plus 1 or minus 1. OK, so this summarizes the linear models that we've seen so far. Any questions regarding this quick recap? OK, very good. All right, so now we also started talking about ways of extending those linear models so that we can also have functions that are not straight lines, but otherwise that are curved. And then this gives us nonlinear models. Uh, so we did this both for regression and classification. So I'm going to write down again on the board uh, a, a short summary of the models that we've considered so far. And the idea is that for the rest of the course, we're going to continue to expand on these nonlinear models. OK, so first, nonlinear regression. So y is going to be w transpose phi of x. And here, the idea is that for nonlinear regression, we essentially generalize linear regression by replacing x with a mapping phi of x, where the idea is that we're mapping our data into a new space. And then as long as this mapping is nonlinear, even though we're going to do linear classification in the new space, it is effectively nonlinear in the original space. So this was the trick that we've considered so far for doing linear regression, or sorry, for doing nonlinear regression. Now, what we're also about to talk about is um, multilayer neural networks. OK, so I'm not going to write any equations for this one, but that's an important class of models. And then we'll see that instead of having to assume uh, a certain set of basis functions, we're going to have adaptive basis functions. And then um, we can relate, essentially, those multilayer neural networks to uh, this form of generalized linear regression. OK, and then if we consider nonlinear classification, so we've got first generalized logistic regression.
And then so similar to what we did here, we can consider the binary in a multi-class case. So for the binary case, what we did is we simply replace x by phi of x. So sigma is of w transpose phi of x. And for the multi-class case, same idea. So it's going to be e to the w k transpose times phi of x divided by the sum over j e to the w j transpose phi of x. OK, and then if we consider the generalized perceptron, then in the case of the thresholding activation function, we have again the sine of w transpose phi of x. And then for the sigma id, the property of y is equal to the sigma id of w transpose phi of x. OK, so as you can see, when it comes to nonlinear models, so far our trick has always been, let's replace x by some basis functions, phi of x. Those basis functions are nonlinear, and therefore, whatever we do into a new space that's linear is effectively nonlinear in the original space. Right? So all of the techniques that we've seen so far can be adapted in, in this way. Now, this is great, but then an obvious problem is what, uh, what about the choice of phi? How do we get phi, right? So, so we're going to need some uh, techniques to, to deal with this. OK, before I move on, any questions regarding this quick recap? Everyone's good? Excellent, OK. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, to summarize, we've worked a lot with linear models because the algebra is simpler. We can often compute things in closed form. And then whenever we wanted something nonlinear, we came up with this mapping phi of x, which allowed us to still rely on linear algebra for everything else. The problem is that the basis functions are chosen a priori, and then they're fixed. So, if you have a problem where you don't know really in which space this function should lie, and you're not sure what basis functions to choose, then you might choose some basis functions that capture a nice space, but don't capture the ultimate function that you're trying to approximate. So, so the problem with this method is that we really have to choose the basis functions a priori, and we might not have enough domain knowledge for doing that. So then the question becomes, can we work with unrestricted nonlinear models, where here we wouldn't be restricted to a finite set of basis functions, or otherwise perhaps we wouldn't have to completely specify the basis functions a priori. And the answer is yes. So now we're going to see how we can uh, free ourselves from, from this restriction. OK, so there are two ideas for doing this. The first idea um, is that perhaps instead of having a fixed set of basis functions a priori, we could simply choose our basis functions to depend on the data, and then also perhaps allow a very large number of basis functions. In fact, we're going to see in the coming lectures that we could consider an infinite number of basis functions without paying a price. So this is um, a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but we'll see that mathematically there are ways for us to deal with this. And then, so this idea was, in fact, the uh, predominant approach that's based on what are known as kernel methods. And, and then this was essentially the most popular set of techniques uh, in the 2000s up to roughly maybe 2010. And then after that, starting in 2010 or, or around that period of time, then deep learning started becoming popular. 
And in deep learning, the idea is that now we use multiple layers in our neural network. And then we're going to see that the, the main idea is that really the basis functions are not fixed. We're going to uh, adapt them. There, there's going to be parameters inside the basis functions that are going to allow us to essentially adjust them. So even though I have to pick a fixed set of basis functions, because the, even if the number is fixed, the actual basis functions themselves are going to have parameters, and then I'm going to vary them based on, on my training set. So, so today, this turns out to be a, a great idea, and, and that has led to a lot of the successes that we can experience with deep learning. OK, so um, let's start illustrating some of those ideas. Um, so to start with, let's consider a two-layer neural network. Right, so we've talked about the perceptron, which is one layer. But now, what if we consider two layers? So what would that correspond to? So let me draw a, a little example for this. OK, so let's say that I've got three inputs. Uh, so this will be for a feed forward neural net. So let's say I've got three inputs, x1, x2, x3. Uh, let's say that there's three hidden units as well, z1, z2, z3, and three outputs, y1, y2, y3. OK, so if it's a fully connected neural network, then I will have links that connect every input to every hidden unit. So that's what it looks like here. And then same thing for the next layer. And now, all of those edges, they will each have a weight. And I can represent those weights with a matrix. So I'm going to denote this by capital W. And then the superscript 1 to indicate that this is a first matrix of weights that feed into the first layer of hidden units. Then for the second set of uh, edges, there's also some weights. I'm going to denote this again by capital W, but this time with the superscript 2 to indicate that these are um, edges that feed into the second layer, in this case, the output layer of our neural network. And then if I had more layers, then I would just have more matrices like this. The idea is that, you see, I can organize all of the weights into a matrix that's now going to be indexed by the output unit and the input unit for each edge. OK, so now if we look at this slide, you see the hidden unit zj is going to be the activation function h1 of the linear combination wj transpose x bar. OK, so here the idea is that I take a linear combination of my input times the weights for each zj. Right? So each zj has a set of edges that feed in. And then in my matrix, this will correspond to a row of weights. So that's how when I write wj here, what I mean is that I'm taking the jth row in my matrix. And then I multiply this by the column vector x bar. And that's my linear combination. For the output units, I do the same thing. Now I might have a different activation function, let's say h2. But then I also take a linear combination. And here I'm using the second set of weights. So that's why there's a 2 for the superscript. But it's a, it's a linear combination again. And, and now I can think of my entire neural network as really just representing a function where I compose the, the two layers 
where I have here what happens in the first layer and then that feeds into the second layer. So it's really here a composition of, of functions. So in general, any neural network, right, even though it's interesting to think of it in terms of the brain and the network and the neurons and so on, from um, a computational perspective, it's a function. It's simply a mathematical function that happens to have parameters. And here, we're going to denote the parameters by weights. They tend to occur mostly in, in these types of, of linear combinations. OK, so besides taking linear combinations, we also take some activation functions. Now, we can take um, a lot of functions as activation functions, but historically, some of the popular ones included the thresholding function. We've already seen it um, in the case of uh, the perceptron. There's also sigmoid. Again, we've seen it for the perceptron. But then we could consider a Gaussian activation function, a hyperbolic tangent activation function, and then also the identity activation function. So. Here, when I talk about um, the Gaussian activation function, the, it's not that we're computing a distribution per se. It's just that it's, again, the same algebraic formula as the Gaussian distribution. But then that defines a nonlinear function, and we can use it. Right? So other activation functions might be, for instance, the sine, uh, cosine. You can use um, any type of function that, that you wish. Now, this one here, the hyperbolic tangent, let me draw it just so that um, you understand what its shape looks like. OK, so it's a function that starts roughly at minus 1, and then increases, crosses the origin, and then asymptotically reaches 1, or asymptotically approaches 1. Okay, so here this is minus 1, and this is plus 1. So, so it's a function that has a similar shape to the sigmoid, but instead of going from 0 to 1, it goes from minus 1 to plus 1. So in some situations, um, uh, it's useful to work with the hyperbolic tangent function, but it is quite close and quite related to, to the sigmoid. It has the same shape, more or less. OK, any questions regarding these activation functions? Now, I should say that these are not all of the activation functions. These are just examples. So we're going to see more, especially, for instance, the rectified linear unit later in, in the course. Yeah. I have a question regarding this, but I want to ask you that uh, each of these, uh, the output of each of these layers uh, going to be the basis function for the, for the next layer? Ah, very good point. So yeah, so here, these activation functions, if we use them in the hidden units in the first layer, right, then we can think of them as essentially um, some basis functions for the next layer. And, and that's how we can link, essentially, neural networks with these uh, more generalized linear models that we saw earlier. So yeah, so I've got a few slides for this. So let's just continue. OK, so for instance, if now we want to do um, nonlinear regression with a neural network that has two layers, what we could do is set up our layers in a way where I'm going to use a nonlinear function for the first activation function. This is for the hidden units. And then simply the identity activation function for the output. And we'll see that this corresponds essentially to a linear combination of nonlinear basis functions that happen to have some nonlinearity that's really defined by H1. OK, so let's write this down. 
Okay, so for nonlinear regression, so we could write that yk is equal to the sum over j, wkj, times, let's say, the sigma id of the sum over i, wji, xi. OK, and now this part, I can interpret it as a nonlinear basis function. And this part here is really a linear combination. OK, so this is a neural network. At least it's uh, the mathematical formula that corresponds to a two-layer neural network where we have some hidden units that have a sigmoid activation function. And then we have some output units that simply have the identity activation function. And what I mean by identity, again, is just that the output is the same as the input. Okay, So the, the, there's no activation function per se. We just return the output as it is. So now, when we look at this expression, right, we've got a linear combination. So this is great. This is just like what we did before. And now, instead of having phi of x, I have sigma it of the sum of the weights times x, right? So the idea is that I can think of my phi as really being the sigma it here. So the sigma it acts as a, a nonlinear basis function, but it's a sigma it that is parameterized by some weights. Okay, so earlier when we said, oh, we're simply going to map our data into a new space, we're going to define some function phi to, that is nonlinear and will get us into a new space. We said, well, we can use the sigmoid for this, but now beyond just using the sigmoid, I'm going to introduce some powders that correspond to the weights. And what I'm effectively doing now is allowing my basis functions to adapt as I train. Whereas before, I needed to specify my basis functions and then they would remain fixed. Now I allow the basis functions to adapt as we train. So that's the main difference. OK, so this is for nonlinear regression. We can do the same thing for classification. So I can compute the probability of yk to be the sigma id of the sum over j, wkj, sigma id, sum over i, wji, xi. OK, and again, this part. We can think of it as some nonlinear basis functions. And then this part is a linear combination. And then this here is just to return a probability. So again, if I have a two-layer neural network, then, and I use a sigmoid activation function for both layers, then what I can do is think of my first layer as computing basis functions that are nonlinear, just like what we did for nonlinear regression. And then I take a linear combination of those, 
and then I simply pass this through a sigmoid in order to obtain a, a probability for each class. Okay, so, so this is an interpretation where it corresponds essentially to what we did with logistic regression, but with an important difference where now the basis functions uh, that are essentially phi of x, right, then they're not just phi of x, but they also have some parameters, the w's, those weights here, that allow us to essentially adapt the basis functions. So, so this is the beauty of, of uh, this framework that now we're not restricted to fixed basis functions, but instead we allow the basis functions to adapt and vary as we update and train our network. Okay. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. Uh, shouldn't this be a uh, uh, y of k even x? That's just that's function, right? So y of j? P of y given x. Oh yeah, P of y given x. So yeah, so this should be, yeah, we could write it in this way. Yeah, P of y given x. Yeah. Yes. In our nonlinear basis functions, where does the nonlinearity come from? If we're taking linear combination of x, Okay, so the nonlinearity comes from the sigma is here. Right, so, so this part corresponds to the basis function. Right, so you see, if you go back to what we wrote before regarding generalized logistic regression, generalized logistic regression, we had the sigma in, then there was essentially um, here some W transpose phi of x, right? So this is just matrix notation to indicate that I take a linear combination of each weight times the corresponding basis function, and then that basis function is essentially now this sigma So using the sigma, we can replicate any other basis function that we previously had to have a priori. Uh, maybe not replicate any type of basis functions, but at least we can um, work within um, a more flexible space of basis functions, because before we would have had to specify phi of x, uh, all the, the phi's that we want to consider. Now what we do is we say, well, let's consider basis functions in the family of sigma it, and, and then we're going to have some parameters, and then the precise basis function is going to be defined by the parameters w that I update as I train. Yeah. So here, obviously, okay, we don't have to just consider sigmoids. There, this could be a tan h function, for instance, or you know, there, there's all kinds of other functions like the Gaussian that we could consider too. So, so obviously, there's still a family of basis functions, but within that family, at least now we have some powders that give us some flexibility to adjust. Yeah. Um, on the left-hand side of your left. Right, okay, so I, I guess, yeah, here I could also write this as probability of CK. Um, yeah, so the idea is that if we're doing classification and then I've got a unit, um, the, so um, I guess a node, that's the kth node, so that's why I had YK, uh, but then now, with neural networks, we're not going to distinguish so much between classification and regression. It's just a matter of what um, activation function I use. You see here, I can achieve classification by having a sigma activation function. And here, just by having an identity activation function, I can do regression. So in both cases, I'm going to return some output. Um, and, and then I guess um, I'm going to denote this by yk. And, and then it's just that here the yk is really the probability of the kth class. Yeah. Yeah. Is this for multi class? Yeah, so here we can do this for multiple classes. The difference is that instead of using the sigmoid, I will have to use a softmax at 
at, uh, in terms of the activation function here. So that's another possibility. Okay, very good. Let's continue. All right, so now that we understand how we can use two-layer neural networks um, to represent some interesting nonlinear models, the next question is how do we do the optimization? And here, the optimization is going to be with respect to both the weights of the linear combination, but also the weights that essentially define the nonlinear basis functions. So we want to optimize both W1 and W2. If there's more than two layers, all the other weights that we would have. So, okay, there's lots of algorithms that we can consider. Um, what is the most popular is just to do some form of error minimization where we compare the output of the neural net to some target, compute some difference, perhaps squared loss, and then minimize that. So if we do that, then there's a, a popular algorithm known as backpropagation that essentially allows us to take the errors that are computed at the output and backpropagate them through the network in order to compute a gradient with respect to every weight, not just the weights near the output, but the weights anywhere inside the network. We can also do maximum likelihood, maximum posterior and Bayesian learning, but then um, to keep uh, the course contained, and since these are not as popular and not as scalable, then I'm gonna skip those. Okay, so if we go ahead with error minimization, perhaps um, the most common type of objective would be to minimize squared loss. And here I'm going to denote by f the function that represents my neural network. So, so the neural network produces an output. I compare this to my target y, then measure the difference, square that, and that's what I'd like to minimize. Um, and here, uh, if we're doing regression, right, so it would totally make sense that we would simply want to minimize squared loss, and this could be, for instance, the, the type of network. So now, with um, a loss function or an error function defined, then a simple approach is just to say, let's compute the gradient, and, and then uh, take a step in the direction of the gradient. So in general, it won't be easy or it won't be possible to uh, isolate the weights by setting the gradient to zero. So this trick um, was only working for some simple linear models, but once we go nonlinear, that usually doesn't work, okay? So, so then instead we'll simply have to take steps in the direction of the gradient, and then our update algorithm will be as simple as this. Okay, so now, um, to compute the gradient, um, the next question is, is there an easy way of doing this if we have networks that could have arbitrary architectures? Okay, so here what I mean by arbitrary architectures is that there could be multiple layers, there could be different types of activation function in the layers, and then the edges might not connect every pair of nodes, but you could have like some skip connections or you could have connections that go anywhere in, inside the network. Right, so then how can we compute the gradient easily? So okay, com uh, from a computational perspective, the backpropagation algorithm is, is an answer. Now today, we don't do this by hand anymore. We use automatic differentiation. So what I'm going to show you in the next few slides is how we can compute the gradient by hand so that you can understand what is really happening under the hood. But then in packages like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, then what they make available to you is uh, some uh, tool, some library to essentially do automatic differentiation. So basically, you know, if you're not comfortable with calculus anymore and, uh, you know, computing partial derivative doesn't excite you anymore, then that's okay. So those packages uh, do this automatically and then you can just call some functions. Here the intuition is that no matter what the neural network encodes, it will boil down inside the computer to some combination of basic functions like addition, multiplication, divisions, and then maybe exponential, sine, cosine, and things like that. And then the composition of those functions, we can compute the derivative automatically by using the chain rule, 
and then knowing what is the um, derivative or the partial derivative for each one of them. So in any case, what I'm going to do next is show you how to derive these things by hand for one example, but then when you use a package in practice, you won't have to do that, but at least now you understand what is being computed really. Okay, so to illustrate the backpropagation algorithm, the best way is to think of it in two phases. So there's going to be a forward phase where we're going to compute some estimate for the output for every uh, data point in our data set. And then we're going to compare that output to the target and then compute the error between those two. And then the error is going to be used to backpropagate some um, quantities that I'm going to call delta. Okay, so, so delta is going to be some measure of error that I'm going to backpropagate in the network. And then this will allow me to compute a gradient or partial derivative with respect to every weight. So essentially we need two phases, a forward phase that just corresponds again to computing the output of the network and then a backward phase where we backpropagate errors and compute derivatives. Okay, so just to illustrate, let's draw a picture. Okay, so for the forward phase, let's say that I've got two inputs, x1 and x2, um, two hidden units z1, z2, and two output units z3 and z4. So let's say that they're all connected. So it's a fully connected network. So what I'm going to do in the forward phase is essentially just start with the inputs for each data point and compute what is the output z3 and z4. And then for the backward phase, so I'm going to back propagate some error measures. I'm going to start from the output delta 3 and delta 4. These are going to be derived from z3 and z4. And then I'm going to propagate them back. So I'm going to go in the reverse direction, essentially following the links, but in reverse direction to compute delta 1 and delta 2. Now I can stop here. I don't have to go any further because the inputs, x1 and x2, are essentially given to us, right? So the inputs, there's nothing, there's no errors here. They are what they are. Right? It's just for the computational units, z1, z2, z3, z4, that there might be some error, and that's why we backpropagate down to here. OK, so in the forward phase, what we're doing is computing um, what is the output of every unit zj? And every unit is essentially taking a linear combination of its inputs multiplied by the weights and then passing this through an activation function, right? So, so that's essentially what I've got here, right? So I just do the computation forward. Now the backward phase is where it gets interesting and that's a little bit more tricky. But the backward phase, uh, the goal here is to compute the gradient or the partial derivative of the error with respect to every single weight. Now, it will be easiest for us to think of this partial derivative in two steps. So we're going to use the chain rule for partial derivative, where instead I'm going to compute a partial derivative of the error with respect to aj for every unit and then the partial derivative of aj with respect to the weights wji. Okay, so we're going to do it in two steps like this. And then it turns out that this partial derivative of the error with respect to aj will be equal to delta j. And then the partial derivative of aj with respect to each weight wji will be equal to zi. 
Okay. So, all right, let's see now how we can obtain those partial derivatives. So the first one, partial derivative of the error with respect to AJ, I can start at the last layer, my output layer. This will be the base case. So for every output unit J, I'm going to compute this. So here, I'm not showing you the steps, but if you do, if you do manually uh, the computation for the partial derivative of the error with respect to uh, AJ in each output unit J, you would arrive at this expression, where you take the partial derivative of the activation function times the difference between ZJ and YJ. Now, if we are instead at um, the hidden units, right, then to compute the deltas at the hidden units, now we're going to need the recursive formula where those deltas are going to depend on the deltas of the output units. So this is what the second equation shows. So for every hidden unit j, I'm going to have again the partial derivative of its um, activation function, but this time times a linear combination of the deltas at the next layer. Okay, so, so we're essentially going backward, we're following the links backward. Okay, so to derive this again, it's, it's simply a matter of verifying what is the partial derivative of AJ with respect to WJI. So you can do this as an exercise and you should arrive at this expression. Okay, so this is mathematically what, what is going on. Now, let's do a simple example just to illustrate what exactly would be computed. So let's say here that I have a network that has hidden nodes um, where I have an activation function that happens to be the hyperbolic tangent function. And then here, what will be useful for us is to consider the derivative of, of this function, which happens to be 1 minus tan h of a square. Okay, so you can just take that identity. And then for the output node, um, we're going to have an output, uh, well, an activation function here that will not change the input, so it will be essentially the identity activation function. So let's just use that. This would correspond to some form of regression. And then let's use the squared error as our objective, which is what we have been working with so far. Okay, so if we start with this, then we would follow the following steps. So we would first do the forward phase where we pr uh, propagate our computation for every input. And I'm going to write on the board what we compute for AJ, AK, as well as ZJ and ZK. Okay, so the forward phase, for the hidden units, aj, I'm going to compute sum over i, wji, xi, and then zj is just going to be tan h of aj. For the output units, AK, that's going to be the sum over J, WKJ times ZJ. And then ZK is going to be equal to AK. Okay, so that's the forward phase, right? So it corresponds to simply computing what is the um, output of the hidden units and then what is the output of the output units. Right, so always just take a linear combination, then pass this through the activation function. Okay, and now the backward phase. 
So I start with the output units, right? So I start with those deltas here. And I'm going to compute here zk minus yk. And then for delta j, so this corresponds to the hidden units. I'm going to compute 1 minus zj square times the sum of wkj delta k. OK, and, and these expressions, they come from the previous slide. So this slide here, right? So all I've done is simply apply these rules here, these uh, formulas, uh, to our example where I obtain those expressions. OK, once we have the deltas, what is left to do is to compute the gradients. So let's write down what the gradients look like. OK, so for the hidden layers, this will be equal to delta j xi, which is the same as 1 minus zj squared sum over k wkj delta k xi. And then for the output layers, This will be delta k times zj, which is the same as zk minus yk times zj. Okay, so here, you see, we simply take the outputs of our first phase, the, uh, the zjs and the zk as well as the output of the backward phase, uh, delta k and delta j. And then we simply um, multiply them in this way. OK, any questions regarding these derivations? OK, so the good news is that, again, this is done for you in most packages through automatic differentiation. But now you understand what's going on when you call one of those uh, functions for automatic differentiation. How does it manage to get the, the gradient? It's essentially performing these types of derivations. And then the beauty is that you can change your network, right? So you can play with different functions, different architectures, and then you don't have to rederive manually what needs to be computed. So you can just call these automatic differentiation tools, and then it gives you the gradient. OK, so now the next question is, well, how well can we approximate different types of functions? So we saw earlier that if we have um, at least two layers and enough units in the hidden layer, then perhaps we can approximate arbitrarily closely any function. But even without having a large number of units, here are some examples of some interesting functions where we're using three tan h hidden units and one identity output unit. Right, so it's very similar to the example that we just did. Instead of having just two hidden units, we have three. They're all tan h, just like in the example. Identity for the output, just like in the example. And now we'll, we can see that we can approximate quite well those functions. So here I have a function that's just x squared, another one which is the absolute value of x. This is a, a more complicated function that happens to be an integral. And then here we have sine of x. 
Okay, so these are arbitrary functions, and now the question is, can we get our neural network to approximate those functions well? So here um, we have in, in dotted lines, dotted green, what are the three basis functions that correspond to the three hidden units. Right, because we can think of the hidden units as really being nonlinear basis functions that are parameterized. So once the network converges, then it converges to those three basis functions. And then when it takes a linear combination of those three basis functions, it can actually approximate the quadratic function very well. So here, all it's given are the blue dots uh, that correspond to data. And then the red curve that goes through the blue dots are essentially the fit of the function. So we can see that a function actually approximates almost perfectly the quadratic function. Same thing for the sine function. So three basis functions once they've uh, converged. And then when you take a linear combination, you end up with this approximation, which is quite good. Now these are two smooth functions. If we consider the absolute function, this is a non-smooth function, right? It has a discontinuity, which is uh, where it would reach um, essentially the, uh, this point here. So there's a discontinuity. Now the neural network has a little bit of trouble to approximate this arbitrarily closely. It doesn't have enough units, uh, but still it does a reasonable job. Right? It still comes up with some kind of V-shape, but you can see that it, you know, the V doesn't have um, an angle. Right? It's more curved. But with more units, it could do a better job. And now, if we want to have uh, something that really has a strong discontinuity, then we could consider this function, which is a step function. And then uh, we can see that the neural network approximates it quite well. So it comes up with... Um, uh, some basis functions that it combines together to, to get something that rises quickly. Okay, so let's stop here and then we're going to finish uh, those slides next class. Okay, so last lecture we uh, introduced uh, multi-layer neural networks and then uh, we talked about optimizing them, right? So um, one of the Distinguishing features of neural networks in comparison to other types of models is that they are not just one fixed model. We can come up with all kinds of architectures uh, by varying the number of layers, varying the number of nodes per layers, varying the, uh, the connections between them, varying as well the activation functions. And then so there's really a multitude of our ar architectures. And so then the interesting question is, how can we do the optimization well and effectively for this? And part of the answer is, is back propagation, but uh, more concretely today, it's automatic differentiation. And what this means is that now um, we have some general methods that are essentially based on the computation of the gradient. And then the most basic technique is in fact uh, to do stochastic gradient descent. Now, if we're going to do stochastic gradient descent, um, we can analyze um, the method with respect to various criteria. And in particular, when we look at the efficiency, the beauty is that computing the gradient is something fast. Um, so uh, regardless of what the architecture is, you can do automatic differentiation in essentially one pass through the network or maybe I should say a, a constant number of passes through the network to get all the partial derivatives, right? So, so then you don't have to do a different pass through the network for each partial derivative. You can get them all in linear time with respect to, to the size of the network. So in that respect, gradient computation is fast and, and this is great. Now, this allows us to have a gradient and perhaps take a step in the direction of a gradient and then the simplest is really that you just take a step that's roughly the size of the gradient or with some decaying factor. And if you do this, unfortunately, the convergence will be slow. Okay, so uh, gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent is one of the most basic technique in, in optimization. I mean, the beauty is that it is general, so that's why we're using that in, in neural networks. Uh, but unfortunately, it's slow. And what I mean by this is that the rate of convergence um, is linear only. 
So here, um, a faster convergence rate would be, for instance, a quadratic convergence rate. And then we saw as an example Newton's method. So Newton's method has a quadratic convergence rate, so it, it converges a lot faster. Uh, but on the other hand, Newton's method requires not just the gradient, but to uh, use the, the Hessian. So in other words, the second order derivatives. So, so then uh, there's some different types of scalability issues, because if you have lots of weights, lots of parameters, then the Hessian is quadratic in that, and it's not going to scale if we have a really large network with millions or billions of weights. OK. so. So I guess, yeah, it's slow convergence. Um, the other issue is that um, it is a, a form of uh, local optimization. So uh, you take a step in the direction of the gradient. So yes, you can improve. But then when you get into a local optimum, there might not be any direction anymore. So like your gradient might be 0. And then at that point, the algorithm is trapped. So one of the drawback is that with neural networks, we often have non-convex optimization, which means that we might have a, an objective that, that has many valleys. And ideally, we want to find the deepest valley, so find the, the point in the valley that is the lowest for achieving the lowest error. But then the algorithm might just uh, converge into some valley that is shallow, and then it doesn't find the best solution as a result of that. Now, unfortunately for this, uh, there's no general solution. Um, so non-convex optimization is NP-hard. So, um, so at this point, um, uh, there's little hope that we would be able to find a, a generic solution to that. Um, OK, another issue is overfitting. Um, so when it comes to neural networks, um, often we're going to consider very large models that might have even more parameters than the amount of data. So um, this is an issue because if you um, typically to, to, to prevent overfitting, what you want is just to use a lot of data. And then there's a better chance that it's going to generalize. But then if you have a lot of parameters, then you're going to need more data. And if at some point you have more parameters than the amount of data, then there's a real risk that you're simply going to uh, fit some noise and, and there won't be a good generalization. So here, there are many ways of getting around this. Uh, one technique that we've already seen is regularization, where we can add a penalty term. So for instance, we can simply add a, a penalty that's uh, the norm, the Euclidean norm of our weights. And that will force um, implicitly the weights to, to remain as small as possible. Okay. We're going to see later in the course dropout. This is another technique that is specific to neural networks. And then there's several other techniques. But in any case, um, doing, uh, well, trying to prevent overfitting is, is an important issue in, in neural networks. And then we always have to take that into account. OK, so let's come back to the issue of slow convergence. And for this, I'm going to draw a picture just to illustrate uh, what can happen in some situations. And then we're going to discuss some modern techniques that accelerate gradient descent um, and often perform better in practice. OK, so let's say that I've got a problem with just two dimensions, because that's what I can draw. Um, and Let's say that I've got um, a surface that is uh, some sort of bowl shape, like this. And here, uh, this is in 3D, right? So the, my, my error function or my loss function would essentially be coming out of the board. And what I drew here are essentially the contour lines of a surface where I can think of the surface as a bowl. Okay? So don't think of it as a mountain. So before, when I drew this, uh, in the context of Gaussians, it was a mountain. But in this case here, let's think of it as a bowl. And then the minimum is in the center. And then this bowl is elongated in one direction and then a little um, narrower in, in some other direction. Okay? So now, if we're doing gradient descent, and let's say that we, we start uh, somewhere like here, um, 
so we're not quite at, at the global minimum yet. Um, what gradient descent will do is essentially take a step in the direction of the gradient. So uh, the gradient will, will be, generally speaking, perpendicular to the contour lines. So, and, and let's say here that my ball is a ball that really has um, uh, some, some edges that, that uh, rise quickly, so therefore the slope is steep. So perhaps here I might have an important gradient, and, and then my gradient, if it's perpendicular, um, and I follow it, then it might take me from this side all the way down here. Okay, so, so that's in part because I might have a large gradient, I take one step, I end up on the other side. Now once I'm here, same idea, I'm going to take a step again in the direction of the gradient, and then from here, again, I'm, I'm going per, in a perpendicular way with respect to the contour lines, so I might go like that, okay? And then from here, I, same idea, I continue, and I continue, and so on, and then eventually I arrive at the minimum. So in situations like this where you've got one dimension where the slope um, is a lot smaller and, and then the variation is not as important in comparison to the other dimension, then gradient descent, because it's going into the direction of steepest descent, right, is, is going to perhaps try to go down this direction as opposed to going more towards the middle. Okay, so, so it will have an effect where it will tend to overshoot and then zigzag and eventually reach the minimum. So, so this is, uh, I mean, at some level it's fine, it's, it's going to converge, but on the other hand, this, this zigzagging behavior uh, is not ideal, right? So it's not as efficient as if it just took you know, a few steps that went more or less directly to the middle. And, and then, so there's been a lot of work in optimization to rectify that. And, and then generally speaking, the direction of the gradient is not ideal for big steps, right? We know that if we just take an infinitesimal step, it's a good direction, but then beyond that, right, uh, because of the curvature, um, it might not be the best direction. Okay, so, so gradient descent often has this problem where it will zigzag like this, and, and now the question is, can we do something different to fix that? Uh, but before I answer this question, so let me illustrate another phenomenon that might happen. So let's say that we start uh, here instead. Okay, so we've got again our bowl shape, but now we're along the, the dimension where um, the slope is not as important. So I'm already sort of like, you know, inside the bowl, but at this end. And now my gradient would actually be pointing uh, more or less directly towards um, the middle. But then because my bowl perhaps is, it doesn't have uh, uh, sides that are as steep when I'm looking at the long dimension, then I just have, let's say, a small gradient. So then from here, I would just take a small step and then continue, take a small step, another small step, many small steps, and then I would eventually arrive, but it will, it will take me a lot of steps before I reach the minimum, in part because here I have to take a lot of steps. So here what this shows is that there's something interesting that's counterintuitive, right? So whenever I have a large gradient and I just take one step that corresponds to my gradient, I might overshoot, and then whenever I've got a little gradient, often I'm taking a step, there's actually no danger of overshooting, I'm actually going in the right direction, but I'm just taking small steps. So what this shows is that very often there will be surfaces where you're in, in, in a region where the gradient is small, and really you should take bigger steps because if, if the gradient is small, it means that, that the surface is sort of like stable. There's not much that changes and you could actually go faster, right? And on the other hand, in other regions or other places, you might have 
a, a steep slope, so you have a big gradient. The problem is that making a big steps, because the surface changes too quickly, is not good. You might overshoot or you might not um, achieve something that's, that's very good as a result of that. So, so here, we can't rely on the size of the gradient to determine our step size, and we need to, to adjust that. So a lot of the modern techniques essentially will, will try to deal with this using some heuristics. Okay, so to deal with this, um, one um, algorithm that was proposed several years ago is known as ADAGRAD. And the idea is to adjust the learning rate of each dimension separately. So we um, normally, when we take a step in the direction of the gradient, right, then we simply um, perturb our weights by adding the gradient. The simplest is just to have a, a step size that's one. So here we might have a, a learning rate that would just be one. But now, with what I just described, right, in some situations we might want to take our large gradient and shrink it, or take a small gradient and increase it. And in fact, we might want to do this differently according to different dimensions. Because in some dimensions, we might have a steep slope, so we want to just take a small step. In other dimensions, we have uh, a very small gradient because the surface is, is more or less constant, right? So then you want to take a big step. And so we need to adjust the size in different dimensions independently. So one idea is the following, that what we could do is simply take the sum of the square of the gradients that we've seen so far, accumulate this into a variable, I'm going to call it RT, and then when I um, take a step in the direction of the gradient, I'm going to change uh, the magnitude of the step by dividing by the square root of RT. Okay, so normally, we just have eta here that tells us the size of the step. Um, but now we're going to also divide by the square root of RT. So it's essentially like taking the Euclidean norm, if you wish, of all the, the gradients that, that we've seen so far. And this is dimension by dimension. Okay? So in this case, you see this expression um, is uh, for the um, uh, weight ji. So this is one dimension. And I'm only looking at a partial derivative with respect to weight ji. So I'm going to look at the magnitude of this partial derivative, square it, add this up, and then divide by the square root. So this way, if I've seen partial derivatives that were large a lot in the past, then now what I'm going to do is divide by the square root. So I'm going to essentially adjust and, and not take a step that's so large because my gradient is probably large again. Okay, so this is what uh, happens here. Uh, okay, so this is good in the sense that you see in a picture like this one where I have directions where some, the, the gradient might be large, then I'm going to rescale my gradient or rescale my step size to be smaller. And then when I've, when I've got something small, then it's going to be the opposite. If I have here a partial derivative that is small, Right, then when I divide, it, will, um, it, it might actually increase as a result. Okay, so, uh, so this would have intuitively the right effect. Um, okay, any questions so far? Yes? Yes, that's a very good point. So here, um, because we're taking the square of the partial derivative, this is always positive, and this is always increasing. So initially, when this was designed, the thought was, well, that's a good thing, because um, when I do my gradient descent, uh, perhaps what I want to do is to gradually reduce my step size, and then since I'll be dividing by the square root of RT, and RT is always increasing, then it will have the effect of dampening my steps, and, and then I will eventually converge. 
right? So this was the intuition. The problem is um, usually the learning rate, which is now eta divided by the square root uh, of RT, decays too quickly. Okay, so in a lot of applications, it starts, it's making good progress, but then because this sum just keeps on growing, then we always um, reduce our, our step size to the point where we're just making tiny, tiny, tiny little steps and, and, and we're not progressing anymore. So, so then the algorithm effectively converges too quickly because of that. And so that, that's a problem. Yeah? Uh, what, what's the numerator? Uh, the numerator, ETA, uh, th this is a parameter, um, which is the learning rate. Um, so it's, it's a parameter that we can adjust. And typically, we want to adjust it in a way where we're going to decrease it over time, in part because here, we're doing great in descent, but in practice, we'll often do great in descent with respect to just a mini batch. So it's more like stochastic great in descent. And, and as a result, you know, when we get close to convergence, uh, we're going to be taking steps that are not quite exact. And then so it helps if we can reduce the size of those steps. So that's normally what ETHA, this is normally the role that ETHA serves. But now on top of that, we have the division by the square root of RT that decreases to the overall learning rate. Yeah. What do you mean by dimensions again? So what I mean by dimension is that um, there is one dimension per weight, right? So we've got a neural net, lots of weights. When we compute the gradient, it's a vector of partial derivative, and there's one partial derivative per dimension per weight. Right? And now here I'm showing you some, uh, some expressions, some, um, some rules on how to update each weight separately, so one dimension at a time. Yeah? This is weighting um, all gradients seen in every step the same way. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem that reasonable. Like, let's say we start um, with enormous gradients, but as we approach some local minimum, they get very small. Uh, it seems like this should forget the er like earlier gradients. And that's ah, the first problem yes, very good point. So yeah, so here, yeah, if we start with a large gradient, then it's often the case at the beginning because we're far from the solution and then we can quickly make some progress, then the sum here will be large. And the problem is here we just keep accumulating. So if this sum is large, it's just going to get larger. And when we divide by the square root of RT, then we're just going to make our, our steps smaller and smaller and smaller, but when we're getting close, and now we're in a region where really the gradient is small, we'd like to instead increase it, and, and, and here we're, we're going to decrease it instead. So that's, that's part of the problem. Yeah. So, so then, yeah, your idea here of saying, well, I want to forget some of these earlier uh, gradients um, essentially leads to the next uh, version of this called RMS prop. OK, so this is another algorithm that was proposed a few years ago. The main difference is that in the sum here, we introduce a parameter alpha that says uh, that we're going to take a weighted combination of our previous sum with our new square of the partial derivative. And here, alpha is between 0 and 1. So you can think of this as, as like taking a, a weighted average. And now, because um, RT minus 1 was essentially the previous weighted average, then we can see that uh, all the previous gradients square are going to be weighted by some power of alpha. And then essentially, there's a geometric series here of, of those gradients. So we can think of this as like a, um, a weighted moving average of the previous gradients, where the older was a gradient that we saw, then the smaller is going to be its weight. Because at every step, you see we multiply by alpha all the previous gradients. OK. So, so yeah, so here uh, it means that now we have um, a weighted average. Um, it's, it's some sort of um, um, moving average with an exponential decay. And then it has a property of forgetting some of the older gradients, which is great because then when we get into a region where now our gradients are always small, then this RT is also going to get small. And then it will have the right effect.
Okay, any questions regarding this heuristic? Good. Okay, so now, so yeah, so this, this does improve. Uh, it's still not perfect. One issue is that um, our gradient lacks momentum. So what, what I mean by this is that um, often if you are in a region where the gradient is stable, is, is more or less the same at every step, it's a bit like if you're in a car and you're driving on a road that is straight, the temptation is just to say, well, let's go faster, right? I can, I can just accelerate and then I'll, I'll, you know, it doesn't matter, I'm going in the same direction. But when you need to turn, because let's say your gradient is changing at every step, then it's better to slow down, right? But if, if the direction is the same, then perhaps you want to gain some momentum, you want to increase your speed, and then just go faster and that's okay, right? And then there's nothing in here that will capture this, so we would like to really have um, some way of, of increasing uh, our step size when the direction is, is the same. Okay, so this leads to yet another uh, version of uh, this heuristic that is known as ADAM. Uh, it stands for Adaptive Moment Estimation. And then the main difference is that now we um, take um, a weighted moving average of the gradient itself, store that in ST, and then when we do our update, instead of taking a step in the direction of the gradient, we take a step in the direction of that moving average. So the idea is that if we have seen lots of gradients that um, are really in the same direction, this um, weighted moving average um, is going to be important. But if the gradients are in different directions, then they're going to cancel each other, and then overall, that uh, weighted moving average is going to be smaller. So again, if we look at this picture, oops. Yeah, so when I'm here, right, all the gradients, they go in the same direction. So if I add them together or I take a weighted moving average, right, then um, it's going to have a, a reasonable sum. But if, on the other hand, I consider these gradients where I'm zigzagging, so I'm essentially going in one direction, I'm reversing, not completely, but reversing somewhat, and, and so on, then when I add up all of this, right, then it's going to give me uh, something that is smaller as, as a result, okay? And, and then, so uh, overall, then it's better to look at sort of like the trend over the sum of my previous gradients where I give more importance to the recent gradients in comparison to the older gradients and then um, it, it will have the right effect here. Okay, so, um, yeah, and then when you look at the equations, right, so now we have a, a weighted moving average of the square of the gradient but also of the gradient itself and then we take a step in the direction of the weighted moving average of the gradient divided by here um, the magnitude of, of the square of the gradient. That's, that's the intuition. Okay, so here I should say that all of these techniques are really heuristics. Um, they're proposed um, in a way that they are simple. I mean, you see just a few lines of code. Uh, the beauty is that they are fast. Um, now, the drawback is that we don't fully understand when they work and when they don't work. I, I gave you guys some intuitions, um, so we understand the intuitions, but then uh, these are not mathematical proofs of convergence or of any type of property. Now, when Adam was published, so this was at ICLR in 2015, it came with some theory, there were some proofs of convergence about its properties and, and so on. Unfortunately, um, there were issues in some of those proofs and then later papers essentially showed that uh, they did not completely hold. And then so there's been more modifications done with more proofs to uh, come up with um, something that uh, is, is more principled. But in any case, Adam is one of the most popular technique now in packages like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And so you will see it very often. 
And I should also say that um, there is an important difference between the heuristics that are used in machine learning and then the techniques that are developed in optimization. So this is um, quite interesting because um, these heuristics are very recent, just a few years old. Uh, but then uh, in optimization, people have been studying these questions for decades and have come up with a lot of theory, a lot of effective algorithms. But unfortunately, those algorithms often do not scale well. Like we saw Newton's technique, which is a, a second order optimization technique that takes advantage of the curvature so that when you make a step, it's going to be a good step. But then you need to compute all the second order derivatives. And if you have a neural network with millions or billions of weights, then you can't do that. Right? So quadratic of that is, is, is too expensive. And then so there's some quasi-Newton method or quasi-quadratic method that uh, offers some better trade-offs. But still, generally speaking, they're a lot more expensive than, than these few steps. Uh, so in practice, there is a real trade-off where either you can make a few good steps, but then you pay a high price for each step, or you can make a lot of small steps that are not very good steps, but you make them very quickly, and overall, you end up uh, still closer to the minimum. And so, so far, in practice, um, this is what has been our experience, that these heuristics, despite often their lack of um, good theory, they tend to work well and they tend to often outperform uh, the well understood and the well founded techniques that are much older from, from optimization. In any case, uh, this is an ongoing field of research and then I would expect that in the coming years there will be more proposals and, and more advances and, uh, and eventually we'll, we'll arrive at techniques that perform both well in terms of the theory and, and the practice. Okay, any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. So, um, just to illustrate, uh, when Adam was published in 2015, uh, the authors included uh, some empirical comparisons. You can see here Adam versus Adagrad, another technique called SGD Nesterov um, on MNIST using logistic regression. So this is more or less the same as what you did for uh, assignment two. Uh, you worked with um, uh, a, a simplified version of, of MNIST, but otherwise it's the same problem of logistic regression. And then you can see that uh, Adam is quite fast at finding a, a good solution. And then here's another problem where um, there are different uh, optimizers again. And you can see that Adam is performing quite well. So it's not always the best technique, but uh, in practice, it does tend to work quite well. OK, any other questions? Yes. What's training cost here? Uh, what's the training cost? Oh, OK. So I think, I think here it means um, uh, the loss function with respect to the training set. And yeah, so here, I guess when we do optimization, just plain optimization, right? we want to evaluate the progress of the algorithm with respect to the training set. Now in machine learning, this could lead to overfitting, right? So we also want to show what happens on the test set. But here, in terms of just evaluating different optimizers, it makes sense to see you know, how well they perform in terms of uh, arriving at, at a good solution with respect to the training set. Yeah. Oh, OK, I didn't mention this in the slides, but RT and ST are both typically initialized to 0. Yeah. OK, so let's move on to the next set of slides.